I'd like to welcome uh, the delegation from the Northwest. Uh, you're all most welcome, uh, and we're looking forward to this session on uh, effective, effectively the work you're involved in on a cross-border basis, and obviously on a, a pan-European basis uh, with regard to advanced communications technology. So, on behalf of the committee, I would like to formally welcome you. As representatives of the European Regions Network for the Application of Communications Technology, uh, Mr. Colin McColgan, Ge General Manager, Councillor Jared Diver, Derry City Council, who is the sitting chair, uh, Vice Chair Councillor Rena Donaghy, uh, Donegal County Council Board Member, uh, newly elected Councillor Neve Kennedy uh, from Donegal County Council Board Member, and Mr. Brian Boyle from Donegal County Council Board Member. Um, I have a good bit of knowledge about the group myself, uh, having uh, been a former chair, uh, familiar with your work, but I think this is a good opportunity to put a lot of the good work you've been involved in on public record. And obviously, from a committee point of view, um, there may be opportunities to explore in terms of, of um, help and assistance in, in different parts of, of, of the country, both north and south. Uh, and the organisation works to develop a number of digital projects and to secure <laughs> EU funding. So we look forward to exploring with you the importance of technology in driving economic development and supporting business and discussing how the experience of other regions can be applied in the North West. Um, so you're very welcome. Um, but before I call on Colm to make his presentation, or maybe Jared might be up first maybe to do an introductory, introductory comment, um, I have to read into the record privilege um, before I invite you to make your presentation, I want to advise you that you are protected by absolute privilege and respect of utterances at this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease making remarks in a particular manner, you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter to only a qualified privilege in respect of your remarks. You are directed that only Commons evidence in relation to the subject matter of this meeting are to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the fact that, where possible, you not criticise or make charges against a member of either House of the Rock, this person inside the House, or an official by name, or in such a way as to make him or her identify him. Okay. So, uh, without further ado, I'm calling Jared. You. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy McHugh. And uh, can I say I'm delighted to be here today as the chairperson of the AirNet Network. Um, we very much appreciate the opportunity to be able to address the uh, the committee. I understand the work that you're doing is very important, and I think that uh, uh, you've obviously cast the net wide in terms of the things that you want to be um, briefed on. Um, I have been on the, the Internet network only for a couple of years at this stage, um, but the network's been around for over 20 years and was initiated between the two neighbouring councils on the northwest of the island, uh, Derry City Council and Donegal County Council. And uh, quite prescient, actually, 20 one years ago, um, uh, a network that was founded to look at uh, communications and particularly through uh, ICT, the application of ICT, and we all know what has happened over the last 20 years. I don't even think the internet was around 21 years ago, so I think that was that was quite um, far-seeing to create that network, obviously in part prompted by our physical location. We are uh, local authorities based on the northwest of the island which is on the northwest of Europe. So that's a big challenge in terms of our peripherality and uh, the linkages and uh, relationships that we have with places outside of our region. Um, the, the network has actually worked very, very successfully over those 20 years and has had a lot of cooperation, uh, which you know, Chair, because you were directly involved at one stage in the network um, with other uh, regions, municipalities across the European Union and has very successfully uh, accessed funding uh, for projects, uh, ICT projects, um, to develop all sorts of models of, of good practice and uh, different uh, projects that are able to help uh, member states within the European Union work to, together collaboratively um, on, a, on a better footing in terms of the ICT um, agenda. So um, we've just actually recently returned uh, from a trip to Atlantic Canada. So. Uh, Iron Act is now actually looking uh, outside of the European Union in terms of some of its remit as well, and then our relationship uh, with our friends across the Atlantic. And I think that's a very exciting uh, development in terms of the work that we're going to be doing, because as somebody who's a fairly recent addition to the uh, network, it would seem to me that part of the difficulty that we've had is that we've 
hidden or light under a bushel in some senses in terms of the achievements and the work that's been done uh, over the past 20 years. So probably, um, uh, Chair, at this stage, it probably would be best for me to hand over uh, to Colm um, just to take us through uh, the presentation and that'll give you some insight into the work that ERNEC has done and what it plans to do uh, in, the, in the future. So thank you very much indeed for hearing us here today. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Chairperson, for inviting us. I'd like to echo what, what our Chairperson has said. Um, so we, we wanted to focus on, on uh, uh, high-speed broadband today and the challenges that that presents uh, for rural areas, and particularly for rural areas on, on border regions, you know, which, which tend to be far away from respective capitals. Um, and uh, just my, my first slide there, th this is a just to show how important information technology is, you know, just just some figures which, which you have in front of you, but, um, you know, really th th there is evidence to show that, you know, that um, SMEs, and we have a lot of SMEs that, that, that use information technology, grow twice as fast as ones that don't, so it really is an important thing. Um, the other, th the other aspect of it is, you know, that, that there's a certain amount of fear around, you know, that, that information technology destroys jobs, um, and it does. But for every, th there is evidence to show that for every job that it does destroy, it creates uh, two and a half new ones. So it's something that that we can't ignore and, and that we have to get on board with. Um, we're delighted that, that the, the the joint committee here specifically mentions. That you have a remit on your website uh, regarding communications infrastructure, uh, because we feel it's 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 really one of the most important assets that any area uh, can have. Um, and one of the main things we want to do today is, is to show you what we've learned, uh, what is happening, I suppose, outside Ireland and outside the United Kingdom, uh, in other parts of Europe, uh, particularly in the Nordic countries, where where they're uh, very far thinking in, in how they approach this challenge. Um, as Chair has said, you know, Airnet has been around for 20 years. In that period, uh, we've engaged with about 130 regions. Uh, today, we're engaging with um, about 50 regions uh, on a whole range of development issues around uh, digital. And of course, it does embrace the, the, the infrastructure, but it also deals with the services uh, on top of that and how they can be used. Uh, for the good of society, uh, for the good of business, uh, for education, etc. Um, th this is just a, a, a flavour of the type of projects that we're working on at the minute. Top one there is about broadband. That's that's really a group of um, uh, regions in Europe, ten regions in Europe that that have substantial rural areas, uh, and they're very concerned. You know that. Uh, you know that the business case for the private sector just doesn't stack up, uh, and therefore you have to put in public money if you want to, uh, if, if you want to install very good broadband in rural areas. Of course, this all comes at a time when, uh, when national governments are strapped for cash, so it's 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 the worst situation you can you can meet. Um, there's other projects there as well that deal with things like uh, the using the internet to deliver public services. Um, how different regions can use it, for example, uh, to develop or, or to promote their tourism by, by developing apps. So these are some of the projects that that um, that Airnet are currently currently involved with, and it's, it's just to give you a flavour of the, the the type of work that we do. Um, one, I just mentioned that you know a lot of public authorities around Europe um, are very interested in this whole concept of uh, open data. Uh, and how you can better use uh, social media and, and social media channels for delivering public services. So we, we have a project which is looking at that. Um, Jared has already mentioned um, that, um, that, that we've now started to look uh, to the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and that really was prompted by the fact that for the first time the European Union has a, a strategy for the Atlantic, for our side of the Atlantic, uh, and it specifically references um, the, the Canadian and, and the American side of things. Um, so we went there to see if, if, if there would be a basis for cooperation, uh, and we're <coughs> delighted to see that they were very open to that type of uh, collaboration and a lot of things in common, a lot of common challenges. Um, 
So that's really an introduction to your neck. I just really wanted to talk a bit now about present to the committee um, about broadband in, in, in the border areas. Um, and this, um, we would say that up until about you know the 2007, which 2008, which was the end of the last interreg program programme uh, before this, um, there was a big emphasis on telecoms. Um, and th that period, say between 2000 and 2007, um, there was a lot of good work done on, on the Northwest Corridor, uh, particularly between Derry and um, Letterkenny. Um, about 2010, there was actually no cross-border fibre linkages uh, in the area. Um, but through a combination of, of uh, good support from the two councils, Derry City Council and Donegal County Council, um, at that time there was probably more uh, funding about from, from national governments as well, with good support from Dublin and from Belfast. Um, at the end of that period, um, there is, you know, four cross-border fibre links there now. The one you probably all know about is, is Project Kelvin, um, which was very well supported by the two governments. Um, but there are other ones there as well. Um, and we, we would think that, you know, that without that support from, from the cross-border programmes, it certainly would not have happened uh, in, in this particular part of the border. Um, since, that, since the end of... You know, the, the, the way these programmes are running, uh, seven year, five to seven year cycles. Um, so that there is another one which is just finished now and, and there was very little uh, broadband, provision for broadband in that particular programme. And the new programme that's been discussed now and is under public consultation, um, there, there's absolutely none in it. Um, so... So this is the Interreg programme? Sorry? The Interreg programme? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, that's not saying that some broadband things may not be done in it, but it certainly is not. It's not mentioned in there, and it's not given the, the same priority. Um, so that's that's just a, you know, and we think that because we did so well out of that one and, and bringing up the, the the infrastructure, you know, that 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 might be present some kind of a problem for us. Um, what what I <coughs> we, we we I suppose in the past. You know the problem with the, the challenge with broadband was actually to you know to get the big fiber links coming into your to your area, uh, but now the challenge has moved in, in how do you get high speed um, you know in, into people's houses, into farms, uh, into small businesses located in rural areas, um, and this is something that that um, that's been looked at very seriously, I suppose, in, in, in Finland and Sweden, and I, I have some examples here from from Sweden. Um, um, like, we, we know that the market will look after, you know, bigger towns and cities, and, and that will be the case on the border as well. Um, but a lot of people in in, um, in Donegal and, and the Derry City Council rural area uh, do live in the country, uh, and it's quite expensive. Um, to put broadband into those places. Um, now, th there would be a, a view, you know, that high-speed wireless will be a solution for, for rural areas. Um, but if you, if you look at... Yesterday there was an announcement in the paper that uh, parts of Dublin will be getting 1,000 megabits per second. Uh, you know, so if you somebody who's getting 1,000 megabits uh, as opposed to somebody who might be getting 40 or 50, we think as, as time goes on, that's going to create a problem. Uh, and this is exactly the challenge that, that has been uh, looked at in, in Sweden, um, where they're putting uh, a fibre cable into, into, um, into farms, into houses, etc. Um, and the, the kind of model, which is quite different from ours, you know, to so start off with, is that most of the actual uh, fibre networks are, are owned by the public sector, uh, and then the public sector uh, lease these back to to the private telecom operators to deliver their services over. So it's it's quite different from from the way we we have evolved here. Um, the this is an example from a, a county uh, in the north of Sweden. It's 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 very remote. Very sparsely populated compared to any, anywhere that, that we would have 
in, in any part of Ireland. Um, and they, they have, you know, the, the, the way they, this is a more detailed map, but the, these green spots are actually small communities uh, in that county that have developed their own fibre. And, and what we mean here is they, they've actually gone out and built it themselves um, because 80 to 90 percent of the cost of deploying fibre networks um, are to do with digging. They're not to do with any of the fancy technologies or the, the fibre cable themselves. Um, so what typically happens there is, is maybe the local authority or a local co-op um, would, would take ownership. Um, they, they would help to plan the routes in consultation with the local communities. Uh, they would make sure that there's sufficient backhaul, this, this type of thing. Uh, they would train uh, local people up, um, people with JCBs and tractors, um, uh, how to dig these trenches, how to, how to fit the special equipment on the back of them and, and do the work. Um, and th we think this is, you know, in these times, uh, whenever we are strapped for cash at, at national level, uh, both, both uh, in the north and in the south, uh, we think that this is a model worth trying here. Um, we've already talked to, we're already talking to DARD uh, in Northern Ireland about it, and, and they're taking a good, hard look at it. Um, our idea was that, you know, we might try a, a pilot, maybe straddling the border um, in, in quite a rural part, so that we could, you know, we could use that to figure out whether that would work here in, in Ireland. Um, so that's. That's, and it, it does pay for itself, you know, over a longer time period than, than the private sector would, would demand. Um, so that's, that, that's really all I want, want to say on that, uh, Chairperson. That's a good um, what, what we might do is maybe, we'll, we'll be, with agreement, we'll open it up now and members will have their own observations and maybe questions. So we'll, we'll keep it fairly interactive. So, uh, no, that... That's helpful. I mean, that, that's something tangible that we can put on the desks of the people that need to be looking at this as a possibility, so, so we appreciate that, Con. Um, okay, who wants, to, who wants to lead it off? Connor, we'll start with you. Connor Murphy. Thanks very much for the presentation. It's uh, very interesting. I mean, I'm very familiar with the issues involved uh, in the area I live and represent. In South Armagh, we have particular problems again with uh, connection for connection for farms in particular because quite a lot of the uh, dard fun our farm filling exercises that are now done online and farm a lot of farms have difficulty accessing uh, proper uh, broadband. Uh, and interestingly, I was dealing with a case last week actually on the old Belfast Dublin Road, and you would think that there would be strong connections there on the, the main route in the island, but there still is. Uh, for small businesses uh, who need a uh, high-speed high, high connection. There still are difficulties there. The approach in the north, uh, I'm not so familiar with in the south, has been obviously from both Detty and DART have given money to Detty to try and give these companies to provide, uh, you know, to hit the spots where there are, there are poor connect connectivity at the moment. In my experience, that's had a limited uh, impact, and that's been going on for a number of years. So, in your conversations with DARD, or I presume with Debbie as well in the north, uh, are you sensing any different type of approach, or, or just more of the same? In that, uh, essentially, people like BT have been given uh, assistance to try and provide more and more. And some people have got it, but it's a very slow, a very patchy process, uh, and we still find that there are large parts. Uh, and I presume if it's happening in my patch of the border area, it's happening right around the border area, large parts which aren't hit at all, uh, the, you know, the more rural, the more isolated you are, the less likely people are to get you, because it's not economically viable for them to, to try and make an attempt to connect you up, even though they're getting public funding for that express purpose. Uh, so it seems that a, a pilot scheme which comes at this from a different perspective uh, would offer up perhaps a solution that what has been tried, certainly over the last number of years, doesn't seem to have had the impact that people expected. Uh, and I'm just wondering, in your discussions with the departments, whatever about in the south, uh, are you getting any sense of a different approach to all of it? Okay, I might, I might take a number of participants first, call if that's okay. Thanks, Connor. Uh, Deputy, Deputy Pringham. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and I'd like to thank you, Nick, for the presentation. A um, couple of comments. So questions, I suppose, really. Uh, the, just in relation to your slide about the 75% of value added by the internet is in traditional sectors. 
Um, I just wondered, have you done any work, research, in the North West Gateway in, in terms of the potential for SMEs to grow job creation and stuff like that there from that? I mean, the Western Development Commission had a very interesting report a few years ago where they estimated that there could be 18 to 20,000 jobs created in the North Northwest region by assisting SMEs in the traditional creative industries to access internet and broaden their, their internet presence and stuff like that, you know. So it's interesting to see that the uh, value added is in the traditional sectors, which is where the potential for job creation in the Northwest would be. So just wondering, have you done any research or anything like that there in relation to that in SMEs and, and Donegal and Derry? Um, just in relation to the ESB electricity announcement yesterday, um, Letter Kenny is one of the towns that's going to be targeted as part of, as part of that. And I'm just wondering about the, the linkages for people broadband into Project Kelvin and into the, what kind of cross linkages there is between all the different providers kind of in the northwest and out there as well. And if there, if there any problems with that and with that evolving. Um, and, and just in relation to the one in Sweden that you had there, I think it's very interesting to see that 80% of the fiber networks are owned by the public sector. And as you, say, as you rightly pointed out, it is the exact opposite of what we have here. And um, obviously, the market has failed in terms of delivering broadband to uh, communities across the country and stuff like that. And what I think we need is a reshaping of public policy in terms of the rollout of broadband and see it as a public good and as a public infrastructure that's, that's vitally important. I'm just wondering if you have any details on costs that the, uh, the Swedish project that they're rolling out there, just how much of the cost and stuff like that, that was kind of information. And finally, just in relation to the, the pilot project you were talking about, um, while I think it probably has some merit in that there, I think the actual, what we should be doing and what we should be focusing on is the ESP wrapping fibre and bringing it on a broad scale to uh, every house in the country mm -hmm. is, is what is now enabled and the, the outworking of the Vodafone via ESP partnership at the minute is part of that and I think that's where we should be focusing and wrapping that up and speeding that up and making sure that it's developed and rolled out across the country rather than, you know, by 2018 these 50 towns will be delivered to, which means that by the time you get down to rural Donegal you're looking at 2030, 2035 probably on the time scale that they're doing now. So I think it might be a better focus or maybe a parallel focus for organisations like Air Act to, to be lobbying on the policy change that would be required and the policy commitment that would be required to make sure that that happens on a broad national scale and perhaps even looking at the, and I know he's here in the, the only network in the north as well that there would be. The, the, are in the net, network in the north as well, so it's something that could be rolled out on an all island basis as well, which would have a lot more significant um, impacts and quicker impacts as well, I think. Okay, yeah, thanks, Thomas. Yeah, I think that's helpful, especially because there is an announcement by ESB and there is a connection with the ESB International in the north as well, so it's something we can explore. Um, Deputy McConnell Yeah, thanks, and I'd like to join with. The colleagues here in welcoming you here this morning and thanking you for taking the time to, to travel down to give this presentation and also like to thank Deputy McHugh for, for hosting you and for, for uh, requesting this at the committee. Um, just a few comments, first of all, in, in relation to the, the role of Air and Act itself, I, I, I see in the title of Air and Act it talks about the application of uh, uh, technology in regions. So, I mean, I may just ask you to comment in relation to your own role uh, do, how much of a role do you have and do you carry out in relation to engaging with the delivery of infrastructure uh, as opposed to the application of it? And just if you comment on that, or is, is the focus more so on, on, on application? The 25 million investment in relation to the North West Gateway um, so far, um, I'd ask you to outline what that 25 million investment has, what that has been, what that has actually been focused on. Also, in terms of the remit of Ernact, what area? Uh, what areas is Air Night covering in terms of ge geographically? Um, you mentioned, uh, and, and the other thing I might ask you to do is, could you give us an update at the committee here today in terms of the various programs which have been announced um, by a government investment or otherwise, and how they are going currently impacting and going to impact on the ground in places like Donegal and elsewhere? Um, what do they mean? what's happening and what's likely to happen in the next couple of years. I know we've, we've had the Rural Broadband Scheme, which is delivered by and large 
um, wireless, uh, low-grade wireless uh, broadband to areas, which is naturally can, can be patchy, but certainly was a development in what was there. But it's a long way from uh, achieving uh, real connectivity for, for rural areas. And although, I mean, in theory, broadband offers, uh, breaks down barriers, breaks down geography, and makes it possible to, to host business or any type of uh, an activity in the most remote of areas, uh, and offers great scope for, for remote and rural areas in terms of engaging with the wider world and uh, developing economically and a more level playing field. The reality has been that uh, the advent of broadband has actually served to even cut off rural areas even more so than before. Because without that broadband infrastructure getting out there, it just actually highlights the um, our remoteness and our disadvantages uh, because we don't have the broadband to be able to uh, that, that infrastructure. So we actually become, a, a low, a something that should give us opportunity to become mainstream is actually making us more remote. Um, I agree, I think the way we have to go, uh, I know you, 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 admit, you said there um, 80 to 90 percent of the cost of laying down broadband infrastructure is digging. Um, yet we do have, um, we do have we have telephone poles and ESP poles going into every con every house in the country. That infrastructure is there. The poles are there. Um, and I'd like you to comment and the, the capacity to actually put uh, fibre on these poles is is is, is possible, <laughs> evidenced by yesterday's yesterday's announcement, which is by and large uh, pri which is privately driven. But I know that's, I think it's just Letter Kenny and Donegal that is, that is included in that. But um, what is the possibility? And I mean, has there been much engagement in, in, with uh, Ernak and, and the state? Or, and you're, just even if you comment in, in, on your awareness in relation to the potential or discussions with regard to actually bringing that out? Because it strikes me as the most straightforward and the only real way of doing this is to put that fiber on a pole alongside your ESP and your, your, or your telecom. Uh, lines into each and every house, and that's the only way we can actually make sure it happens. And it, to me, it would seem to be the lowest cost, the lowest cost model of, of, of delivering it as well. Two other things, I just ask um, if you could comment on, and that is the role of the man's networks in towns, and where that is at, because I, I know and the operation of those, because there was significant investment put into actually putting them there, but the cost of actually having a service from man's delivered to towns uh, or to businesses in towns has been prohibitive of many costs and just maybe any comment you might, any comment you might have in relation to that. And also then, if you comment in relation to uh, roaming uh, with, it, with regard to delivery just of, of, of telecoms infrastructure, and particular, uh, in particular maybe reference say, that's the Foyle Coast, um, which I know uh, Colin may be, be well aware of, just, your comment in relation to that, and if Ernak can or, or is in a position to play any role in relation to breaking down barriers there, because there's still significant cost difficulties for people living along border areas, and I particularly reference the foil, where they have to operate pretty much off a of Northern Ireland mobile, even though they're living in the Republic, and therefore paying paying significant fees in relation to that. And it's a very difficult, it's a real barrier, um, you know, to use of the communications and also uh, to uh, proper uh, availability of reasonably costed um, options similar to what other people are able to avail of. And for no real different, for no real reason other than that companies are charging more, even though my own understanding is that it doesn't necessarily cost them anything. That, that there's ways around it if the willingness was there. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, I'll take uh, Deborah Smith and follow by Sir Andrew Wright. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Apologies, I missed the early, your presentation. I was attending another Foreign Affairs Committee meeting. Um, I just welcome you, and I know Reen over the years, and some of the rest of you I met more recently. Um, the project is a very interesting one. Just one thing from flicking through the, the briefing that we were given. I don't maybe see any mention of your interaction with education, particularly your you're fortunate, I think, you're very well serviced by Father and Higher Education in the North West, Kenny Institute of Technology, then South Donegal is very easy access to Sligo IT, and then in Derry McGee College and other colleges of further education. And as we know, and, um, the colleges are playing an increasing and obvious role in generating local economies and obviously in regenerating the national economy as well. Are the colleges, Letterkenny, Derry, whatever, are they centrally involved in your proposals 
in relation to what's needed for the region and to ensure that the best possible um, potential is, is, is maximised from the point of view of learning, providing services and creating jobs. And you know the way when we, when, when we go out to rural areas in particular, one naturally is, as Deputy McConnell spoke about, easy access to, to adequate broadband is a huge issue for rural Ireland, particularly for people who are who are um, who, de who are working from home in many instances, and if it's only a farmer registering a calf with the department, the, the frustration that there is when there's not a, a adequate broadband. But nowadays, with many with families under financial pressure, many children are, are returning now from third level colleges, staying at home full time. I I have it as Deputy Conan would have in Cavan and Monaghan, people attending the Dalk Institute now coming home, when they don't have have proper broadband at home, it makes it much more difficult for them to study and access the documents um, that they need. But I, I think if there was, from the quick perusal of your document, I'm sorry again I missed your presentation, I think the central involvement of the education providers is absolutely essential in everything we do in providing better services and developing our economies, both regionally and nationally. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Governor Scott. Uh, Senator Wright, follow back. Sure. And I'd like to personally welcome my friend, Councillor Rena Donaghy, a very good friend of mine, she's a tremendous politician in the peninsula. Um, I'd like to uh, quickly ask um, you get the impression that the broadband in the Northwest Gateway is highly developed, but I want to ask you um, is, is the high speed broadband in Letterkenny Dairy area now accessible to SMEs and households in all locations? Like, what have they, has everybody in that area got it? Um, have they got access? And uh, also, very important, what is the quality of the mobile phone coverage for business and for tourists and for, 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 for families? The quality of the, because it's my experience going around Ireland that the mobile phone thing is so erratic, it's hard to believe actually. And then, um, <coughs> have you looked at the broadband issues along the other border counties, Loud, in Newry, Morn, Monaghan, Cavan, and Leitrim? Have you looked at that? And uh, the other point, the yesterday's announcement, joint venture between the ESB and Vodafone is quite ex extraordinary. It's a, a mag magnificent development and it's going to leapfrog the regional towns over the major cities and will use the first time ever, I think it says, that, they, that we will be the first country to use existing electricity infrastructure to bring fibre directly to homes and businesses. First, first, we're the first to do it. To, to use the electricity, and the, um, which is amazing. So it's going to this is this 450 million is going to have a dramatic effect, and just want your uh, comments on that. And it's say just the point that was mentioned a minute ago, and the Irish Times yesterday it said, um, uh, Vodafone chief executive Anna Leary said the fibre broadband network will allow people working from home. Uh, to send very large files to their workplace in seconds. And they will also be able to hold video calls to China um, without disruption. So this is sensational, really announcement yesterday. So just your, thank you very much. Appreciate all the work you've been doing over the years. Okay, thank you, Senator White. And uh, uh, the last day, Deputy Sean Connor. Thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, first of all, you're very, very welcome. I'm very interested, in actually, in the work you're doing in the North West. I live in Monaghan, and clearly it's the same issues at play along the border, between Armagh, Monaghan, Tyrone, Fermanagh, um, Cavan. So um, I suppose the key, the key for me is that every home in the area would have access to, to fast broadband. And as was said earlier, we have a situation where a lot of people are commuting on a daily basis to uh, for their education. And when they come home in the evening, they haven't got access, and it's, it's, it's a major problem. Um, certainly, um, I know uh, as a government we tried to provide extra money to make, ensure there was broadband provided in schools throughout Monaghan and Cavan over the last two years, and that, that's ongoing. But I think it has to go into each household, and, uh, um, and, and, and how that can be done in the lowest possible cost is certainly an area we should be, we should be, we should be trying to uh, focus in on. I was interested in what you said in relation to the Swedish example, but uh, as I pointed out, we do have, a, we do have po poles all over the country here. It's not as if we have to start developing new infrastructure in that, in that regard. But, um, 
Yeah, Roman charges, um, another issue obviously for, for everybody along the ball, Armana. Um, also, the fact that we have very poor 3G coverage in, in places because where the landscape is, uh, uh, it, the nature of the landscape in, in the ball area where I live, uh, tends to be in a situation where you go around every tour and there's, there's, there's the coverage is lost. Um, how have you found, or what are the challenges, or what have you, how have you found solutions in the North West to deal with that? Because uh, I think it's something we, we, need, we, need, we need to basically deal with across the whole border region. Um, thank you, Deputy. Um, is that everybody okay? I'll just hand it back now to the. Sorry, Chair, just a very Yep. Kelvin Project, very interesting, the Kelvin Project. The Kelvin Project is through Monarch Town, and it's right beside the education campus. We, we invested 50 million in, in building the education campus over the last two years. And clearly, we want, we want, we want to get maximum, maximum benefit from the education campus in terms of further education for people in the region. And we would like to be able to utilise the Kelvin Project, but it's, it's, it's just want to find out have you found solutions to actually utilise the project? Because when it was first announced, great fanfare, we felt this would be a panacea to all our ills. But I mean, it seems to be it doesn't mesh well with a lot of with a lot of with a lot of other other infrastructure. So, have you found solutions up in in your region to to, to overcome the problems? Okay, thanks. Just to say, yeah. Letter Kenny is one of these towns that the ESP voted for, of singled out of the fifty regional towns that they're going to. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thanks, Adam. Okay, um, hand it back to you, Colin. So maybe I'll kick off and then everybody else would have a lot of questions here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll I just start by answering in a kind of a general way and then I'll, I'll come to some of the specific questions, you know. Um, <clears throat> there's two things, really. One thing is, is that um, you, you know, we're, we're most concerned about rural areas. We're not really concerned about Letterkenny or, or Derry or Monaghan Town because we, we, our belief is that those places will be fine. You know, there's there is challenges, but but we think those places will will be fine in the medium term, and, and everything will be sorted out with them. Um, the, 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 the the second thing then really is that. You know what, what? What we've discovered, you know, with our work in, in in Europe, is really that the debate has moved on. You know, it's not about putting. It's no longer a debate about putting a fibre optic connection between Letterkenny and Derry, or between Monaghan Town and, and Armagh. You know, that, that 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 is that's happening, and I appreciate that. You know, there's some temporary or short-term maybe challenges with it. But, but the, the, the real debate now is, is moved to the end user, you know, the houses, the farms, the, the small cultural business, uh, you know, uh, in, in very remote areas. Um, and what, 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 what the, 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 the most advanced regions are in terms of their thinking is that, you know, you have to put fibre in, into people's premises, otherwise you're going to be left behind. And I, I think a really good uh, kind of example of this, there was, there was an article in the paper yesterday which said that parts of Dublin were going to get a thousand megabits per second into their houses. Now, very remote farms in Finland and Sweden are already getting that. You know what I mean? So the, these, these very remote regions um, in Finland and Sweden, um, they have raised the point, you know, that uh, uh, Deputy McConnell Oak raised it, you know, that that their areas are becoming even more remote, and if they don't actually take this drastic action, then their communities are not going to survive. And I'm not suggesting that's not going to happen here because we have a much denser population than that. Uh, but but that is really a driver for them. Um, and um, so and what's actually happened because they're because they're putting so much fiber, there's so much fiber going around the place. What's actually what what, what they see happening now, right, is that. The, the, the telecom operators, the mobile operators, are coming to farmers and saying, could I put a, a 3G or a 4G antennae up in your building because you have a fiber optic cable. So it's actually reversing the whole, the, the, the whole thinking around this, you know, because we uh, here, it's, it's also prevalent in, in the United Kingdom, you know, that, you know, that we'll, we'll put fiber into as many places as we can, and then we'll cover the other places with, with, um, with wireless. Um, but what's actually happening in these other places, they're putting fibre in everywhere, uh, and then the operators are coming along and they're, they're putting, they're putting uh, 3G uh, antennae, they're, they're paying the farmer to put up to host, to host the 3G. So they have, not only do they have fantastic 
uh, speeds into their houses using fibre, but they also have a magnificent uh, wireless coverage. You know, so <coughs> places like we have the Drumlands and in, in, in County Cavan or <coughs> the Hills and in, in Donegal or up on the Sparrows, is very bad coverage. And, and um, so it, it, it's becoming less of an issue for them. Um, <coughs> now, the, the other thing then is is that um, like we're very interested in, in what, what the ESB is doing as a, a technical solution, you know, and certainly, you know, th there is a, a, an ESB cable going into every house in, 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 uh, in the south, and, and there's an electricity cable going into every house in, in the north as well. Um, so that is a way of doing it. Um, but that's, that's looking at it from the, the technical solution. And, and a lot of the places that we work with are already doing this. You know, so I, I've seen, you know, noted these remarks saying, you know, we're the first to do this. We're, we're, we're not the first to do it, you know. So people will use the best technical solution you know, to do it, uh, and we would love the ESB to do it. But what we're talking about here is, is, is a difference in approach, you know, like that uh, ESB approach, if it were to be applied to every house in Ireland, would work, right? But um, th that is driven from the centre, um, and the experience that, that we all have over the last 20, 30 years, you know, by the time that hits, you know, Mallon Head, for example, or, or Kerry, or places like that. I mean, that's, that's going to be years down the line. Um, but we're, what we're suggesting here is that, you know, if we had a change in, in approach, where local communities uh, are given a chance to see whether this Scandinavian model would work here, we think it could be done uh, more cheaply and faster, and, and would not be subject to the vagaries of, of uh, central government planning we, we know that's very important, uh, but that, that's also very important in Sweden. But they just give more, I suppose, more, more power to the local areas. Um, and this, the slide that I, that I showed earlier, um, you know, what, what we were able to achieve on a cross-border basis in the northwest, you know, increasing the cross-border fibre connections from, from zero to four in that period between 2010 to two, uh, 2010, or sorry, 2000 and from 2000 to about 2008. In that period, we were able to do that with, you know, with the councils getting together, uh, with the support of central government and and a lot of uh, community groups as well. Um, so we, we we think this approach will work, um, and um, we've we've been talking to Dard about it in in, uh, in the north, uh, and they they seem quite receptive to it. Um, what you come up against then is when you go to, to talk to Deti in, in the north, which are the, the telecom operator, um, and I would also, you know, telecom, uh, telecom regulators are very conservative people, uh, and an order view is that they've, they have become more conservative over the last 10 years, uh, and they don't like these kind of solutions. What they like is, is you know, is, is to, you know, maybe get half a million of public money, and um, what they like to do then is, is they like to, you know, put out a tender, um, and then usually the, the 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 telcos, you know, the existing telecom operators want it, uh, and it is it is a good solution uh, for a lot of for a lot of places, but but we feel that it needs to be to be allied with with uh, this other approach. Um, the the those announcements by the ESB yesterday. Um, they are not going to have any impact in rural areas. You know, they're designed. Uh, they said yesterday towns of above 4,000. Uh, we understand in Donegal that they're only going to be. It's only going to be Letterkenny, which is a town of 10 or 12,000. Um, so that, that announcement by Vodafone and, and ESB is a, is a totally market-driven um, proposal, and it's, it's very welcome. But it, it, but it only works. In the bigger towns and cities, um, so they've obviously done their calculations. Not the need, the smaller streets and towns, not the large cities. They're focusing on 15, a 50 medium-sized town. That's what they're in the newspaper yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, not an hour like and wouldn't call it Tralee and. Um, to yeah. leave from these regional towns over the larger cities. Yeah, but, but we're talking about, like, I mean, it's all, we would agree, our, our view is is that those towns 
will be okay. We're talking about, like in Donegal, I think it is, is it 60% uh, of the population don't live in towns, they live in the, the countryside. Is it 75%? So that solution yesterday will, will not be of, of benefit. But I thought, sorry, I thought you said that, um, like, like, is it available? The, the question I asked is, it, is it available, the broadband, in both counties rather than just the towns to, um, to households and SMEs? Is the broadband in all, in the, right across the two counties? Yes. Chair, it would be fairly patchy once you even um, taken Derry, uh, the Derry City Council area, even once you get outside of the main uh, area population. Um, this is a real, I suppose, a real flipping uh, the mindset of thinking around how you're going to provide broadband. And, uh, you know, and, and I take the point, I mean, anything that's driven from the centre, I think, is going to be of its potential to impact the most remote people. Um, the, these examples that we're giving from Scandinavia, and we've seen these firsthand in these communities. This is where, Chair, it's really a, a, a very strong element of community initiative, where people have got together and actually stepped into that vacuum where the market hasn't been able to do it. And, it, and what I would say to you is, uh, it would be hard to overemphasize the potential impact that could have in rural Ireland, where we're losing people People are migrating towards centres of population because that's where the broadband coverage is or that's where the job opportunities are. So in places like Sweden and Finland, people can live in very remote areas and still work in very high-tech jobs for Nokia or for Microsoft and do exactly what you said earlier about sending large files uh, to their employer or having a conference or a Skype call to somebody in, in China or Japan. So this, in a way, Chair, uh, it, it's something unseen, but I think it could unlock a lot of the problems that we're facing in Ireland outside of the major centres of population to reinvigorate those areas by the application of technology to overcome the peripherality and the problems that we've had. Well, through the, the chair, what, what can we do, this committee, do to help you? On the, the initiative. Well, I suppose in part yeah. it's about influencing public policy. It's about a change in public policy that not coming from the centre, not necessarily influenced by what the market thinks is best. And what the can telecoms. Look at centers, can they? Yeah, and government, I suppose. In our sense, one of the powerful things about Ernect as a network is that it was two local authorities yeah. that decided to. I and mean, we were talking earlier, there were questions about what government policy is. and our awareness of that. This is where two municipalities essentially have yeah. taken the lead and have done something which now has a European mm -hmm. significance. So, but Mr. McCarthy, I won't say anymore. Just what can we? What you're saying here in this, how do we help you to get this ideal initiative? What can we do? This committee do to help you? Yeah. Um, Sean, Sean's. A, I know there's a few in the panel. Not everyone wants to speak here. I'll take Sean, then Thomas, and then Rena, and then Bray. I think the point's illustrated by what you said earlier on in terms of coming from, from, from the smallest communities up rather than from the centre out. Right? I mean, so these initiatives, like they're mentioned yesterday, are all well and good for the large regions and centres. But in, in my own area, the towns like Monaghan and Cavan will get the fast, fast broadband anyway. It's the towns like Beltorbert and Ballybay and Cotill and Castleblaney and Clonus uh, that I'm concerned about that, that won't get this high speed broadband if we don't change our approach. And supporting that these towns do get fast broadband and are not left behind because there are initiatives at the moment for the villages as well but the small towns have been left out and then obviously the individual units the individual farms the individual smes in the rural areas they are they are they are they are in a predicament as well and so i mean i think your approach is correct and um, we have to change mindsets because if we continue talking about oh it's okay there's 50 regional towns getting getting new infrastructure that leaves behind all the other small towns that's, that's you know, this, this is the reality of it. dramatic so just, um, I'm going to take Thomas and then I'm going back to the panel. And, yeah. Chairman, I'll just, I'll just caution one thing. I mean, what, what you're talking about, about the, the small towns that have just been able to apply to get this, to do this themselves, we have a model of that already in this country, which is the group scheme sector. And Donegal County Council has been frozen for the last eight years in terms of group schemes because it's dependent on government grants. So I would just advise you to be careful because, what, because I mean, I could see a lovely fancy announcement where a government minister would stand up and say, yes, we're rolling out this fantastic thing that's going to bring broadband to every town in the country and we'll allocate two million euro a year to it. 
And that's the solution for the government. It's a great PR stunt, it looks fantastic, but it does nothing on the ground in terms of delivering for, for the communities that need it. The Groups King sector, I mean, there's, there's Groups Kings, as Brian would know over the years, in Donegal, that have been trying to get water into their communities for the last 30, 40 years, and they haven't been able to do it because they haven't been able to get access funding. So, I mean, I think, quite I see what you're saying and that, and that there's value in it. The real solution is we own the ESP. It's owned by the citizens of Ireland. Um, we own it. We can. The technology is there. It's feasible. It's doable, and it's not hugely expensive either. I mean, uh, maybe as will be, if you could give us an idea of what the time scale for the rollout is in Sweden in their project, how long they see it taken, so we got there, what kind of investment it has taken from the government to deliver these community projects, and um, what kind of commitment there is to actually rolling it out in a, a reasonable time scale. Okay, thanks, Tom. Now, look, I'm also conscious of the fact that, you know, you, you've already indicated that Darge is quite supportive of the idea. You've also made the proposal that maybe we should look at maybe a pilot, maybe look at one um, village or town that straddles. The, the, and I, I know it's only a suggestion, but like Senator White's asking, like, how can we help, how can we help? I think the job of this committee is to ensure that all the, the contributions are put on the desk of the Department of Communications, uh, Natural Resources, in, in, on this side of the border. And then obviously there's a role for local authorities as well. But I'll hand it back to Rene and then Brian, and then we'll give, give them. Uh, Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Rena Dunhey. I'm a public representative for the uh, Inishore Peninsula. Um, I've been a county councillor for 15 years now, so I'm, I'm fairly aware of a lot of the challenges in Inishore. We have a population of over 40,000. Uh, we are the size of uh, Louth or Leitrim. We're very, very rural. Uh, the lack of broadband is very uh, debilitating for primary schools, secondary schools. Students can't achieve their potential, and I know this. I don't want to rehash and what has already been said, but these are the problems that I'm finding on the on the on the doorsteps on a daily basis. And we've talked about businesses and SMEs, and it's very difficult to keep our graduates at home when we don't have uh, when we're such a, a poor broadband system. And yesterday's announcement, while it was and it is very very welcome, it really doesn't do anything for me or the 43,000 that myself and Charlie McConnell Oak over there represent. Um, it is for larger towns. Um, it's regional rather than rural. Um, the town I represent, Buncrana, has over 4,000 of a population, but I'm not listed in the 50 um, towns that have been listed uh, nationally. Uh, I am the mother of uh, two students who cannot um, use the internet properly because it's, it's, it's much too slow and for uploads and that of, of bigger files and that is just, it's, it is very um, debilitating and the examples that Colin have given are very real examples uh, and, and I've, I've been to Sweden myself and spoken to the politicians there and they've outlined exactly how it can be done and um, Joe and Charlie will be very familiar with a community um, incentive scheme that I have been involved in myself and any show, similar to the group water schemes that, that um, Thomas Pringle has mentioned. This was a community assist scheme. It's part of the Wild Atlantic Way that wasn't able to uh, accept coaches or, or bigger buses. So I initiated a scheme last year where I got public money money from Donegal County Council and I got the community involved with the, their JCBs, men on shovel, shovels and spades, tractors and trailers, and we did a fabulous job. Some of you may have Eileen, saw it, Eileen Magner covered it on the RTE News. But uh, while I welcome yesterday's announcement, what do I say to the 43,000 people in the zone that I represent? Because there's absolutely nothing in it for them and um, it's intended that 100,000 houses will be done each year in this announced scheme for the next five years bringing us up to 2019 so do we in any show wait until after that to get uh, broadband for our area thank you very much and it, it, so we did mention the farmers as well and I have talked some of the farmers, um, the ETB 
DTB have invested very heavily last year and are going to this year again on teaching farmers how to do their business online. And I am teaching them how to do it, but yet when they go home, they, can, they can't do it because they don't have the broadband to do it. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, no, Mr. Bryan. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, just, uh, just, I'd like to refer back a little bit, I suppose, to the discussion about the, the, the scheme announced yesterday, the collaborative scheme between the ESB and uh, Vodafone, which we've discussed here. And I think it's, it's to be very much welcomed, uh, any, um, any uh, significant improvement in telecoms capacity, especially when, when, where it involves fibre to the home, is to be welcomed. Uh, like the limitation of the scheme is that it is only intended to be rolled out in quite high population centres of four to five thousand or whatever plus. But what I think it does mark is, I think it marks maybe an answer to a question that has been unresolved, uh, and that the way to deliver high-speed broadband is fibre to the home because there has been a bit of debate and discussion and I think it's still ongoing actually as to whether fixed wireless or whether even 4G could be the answer mm -hmm. but I think quite clearly uh, the experience coming from Europe and from other places is that is, that is not the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer to delivering high-speed broadband is fibre to the home mm -hmm. and maybe one of the one of the benefits of yesterday's scheme will be, will be maybe to try to get that argument over the line in this country so to speak. Now, there was, a, there was another scheme actually announced as well back in, I think it was March or April of, the, of this year, to bring, um, to bring high speed broadband, and in fact, using fibre backbone was mentioned in the initial documentation, to rural uh, areas. And there, were, there was, in fact, as you probably know, deputies, there was, in fact, a, a, a whole range of townlands mentioned per county. I think there was 40 alone in, in, in County Donegal, in fact. But there was very little detail then as to how this um, scheme was to be, in fact, rolled out. And maybe if, if there is a role uh, that that we can all play collectively in, in that the committee maybe could um, could suggest the Department of Communication then that the model now being used for the collaborative venture between ESB and Vodafone in the bigger towns is now the model that uh, should be used also for the rural areas. And as uh, Deputy Pringle has said, th there is a huge advantage actually in using the publicly owned ESB network, which services every house effectively in, this, in the land to, 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 to deliver the fiber connectivity. But it would be a shame actually if that scheme was delayed pending the delivery of this other scheme because we could be looking at a very very long time scale and in fact um, uh, just referring then to um, the, the, the the question as to whether the, the Scandinavian model uh, of the fiber the fiber in the ground or the fiber overhead I've actually seen an example in Slovenia in fact last year one of our partners in one of the projects where they, where they use both models they, they build the networks in the ground and they also run fibre on the on the electricity network as well, uh, in terms of what suits particular circumstances. So, so that it might be that there could be a combination of circumstances which could suit here, actually. Uh, but the important thing, I think, from our perspective, is that is that the policy policy decision would be made that this is the way to do it, and then we would figure out a way of doing it quickly. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Just, just to say, it is important. I mean, I mean, yesterday's announcement from the broader sense, like they, it, what they're saying is, we, we will become the first country in Europe. Like, there's, you know, I know we're focusing on the, the on the rural, but it's important. We are the first country in Europe to utilise electricity. With the, you know, well, that that's according to DSB and Vodafone. Ireland will become the first country in Europe to utilise existing electricity infrastructure to deploy, to deploy fibre directly to homes and businesses and initially reaching half a million premises. So we can't, in our discussion, just, you know, uh, deflate what happened yesterday because it's, a, it's exactly the way we will have to be going. But I'm disappointed that, um, that it's listen in there that um, seems to be very little, like, the question I asked there about um, how many homes are getting the, 
you know, the other, what you were saying, cancer, Donna, he likes, yeah. like, I'm disappointed to hear it's so sparse. <coughs> Just one quick comment. You know, some contributions were made there, given the impression that there's no broadband anywhere. You know, I think we need to balance that. There's there's very good broadband service available in some towns and villages, but it's very patchy. And you know, I didn't have the opportunity to read the statement, the announcement yesterday. But what I often worry about is we've had numerous initiatives in the past 12, 10 or 12 years in regard to moving out broadband. Maybe it's a coordination and, and a, maybe an onus placed on the telecoms providers to provide broadband so to everybody. That can spend, but could we ask members to go off the phone? I think there's a phone somewhere interrupting. But sorry, that is right. Maybe the, the route to go would be to put an onus on the telecoms providers to provide broadband to every house in the country. Yeah. Because we'd have initiatives, we still have pockets left out. I know of some villages and towns in my own county that have no broadband and then out the road half a mile, people fall in between one in broadband enabled exchange, as it was, and another that's not broadband enabled. You know, the Chisical town was a small village then, had a, had a small exchange then, and they haven't been broadband enabled. So there'd be, there'd be pockets left out, unfortunately. And I think Rena made the very good point. Um, people can go to classes, get the skills, they're not able to use them at home then to do their practical work. So, so it is a, it's a very, very serious issue. And, um, and I don't know. Um, I think you need to put together local authorities, local statutory agencies, national government, everybody has a role to play in it. And there has, one leaving it to the other it won't happen. And you know, every month that was by that a household or a business is without broadband is a huge loss to them. So it's an issue of the utmost importance. And you know, I, along with the chairman, I represent Camp Man in a big rural area as well. That, that, and we have particular problems with the drones, which, which defies logic in this era of so called technologically advanced that a hill can still stop a message yet across. It baffles me at times, so it does. Thanks, thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Smith. I can relate to that contribution. Is are there any other anyone? No, if we're happy, we will have a final word. Yes. Sorry, yeah, no, Chairperson, to just to just in a few maybe Colin, if you come back on a few of the points I mentioned there, and thanks to, to Rena and Brian for your contributions. I'd like to acknowledge the work that Rena and Brian have done through Donegal County Council. Rena is a long time member, member of Ireland, uh, has been very proactive in this, and also congratulate. Um, the if um, on her recent election to to Donegal County Council and commend Jared for for his work in Erin Act as well. But I think I mean the problem here is taking a grip of what's required. And things are moving along. Technology is moving along. The developments in the larger urban centre are happening. Uh, and there's periodic announcements from government about we're going to deliver this to rural areas and delivering that to rural areas. And it ain't really happening uh, outside of where the companies are actually um, are actually driving it. I might ask you, Colin, particularly, if you could come back on a few of the points I made, just in relation to the scope of Air Night, the counties that you cover, okay? But um, also the 25 million that was invested in the Northwest Corridor so far, what, what that went into. Um, whether you have a role in relation, or you could have a role in relation to the um, uh, roaming, uh, and that's, that's something you, you, you could have uh, um, a capacity. And the, um, you mentioned in your previous contributions as well about, I think it's the, the, there are countries which are doing 3G wireless from fixed line addresses and paying farmers for it. Um, I mean, that sounds like, I mean, that's a, that's a very simple idea, but it's, it's, it's quite an exciting one. And um, I mean, a, a problem uh, in many of our rural areas at the moment is even mobile, uh, good mobile reception. It sounds like one which which could be which could be um, which could be pushed and, and um, uh, have a lot of have a lot of value, but. And the other thing I asked to mention, and Brian tipped on it, maybe Brian wanted to come in, the announcement was made a few months ago in relation to delivering broadband to rural areas. I mean, what exactly do we know about that? What's, what is that? Uh, you know, uh, uh, can, can you elaborate on what you're aware of in relation to that? Because if you guys aren't, I mean, nobody in terms of the North West knows more about how we can deliver broadband and where it's at than yourselves. 
And if you can't, and if you're not clear on what exactly is being forced in relation to that, then there's a difficulty there, and there's an issue there in relation to what exactly is happening at national level, or what the what the substance is behind the announcements we're hearing. And just then as well, what where do we need to go? What needs to happen now to drive this and make this happen? Um, is it, I mean, the, to me, the, 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 on the poles are the way to go, not to actually dig in. Now, you mentioned in relation to the Swedish model there, they're digging. But when we have the poles, that certainly seems like the like the, the, the way to go. Um, what needs to happen in terms of getting the ESB on board? Um, could, we have, could we have situations where schemes can be developed at local areas where uh, even co-ops can maybe put together um, self-sustaining and self-financing products which could see the investment on ESB poles in areas but which would pay itself back over time? Is there models that need to be, need to be developed and, uh, in, in relation to that? It seems to me that there isn't anything, but I like your perspective uh, on, that, on that landscape and on what needs to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just very briefly, in response to uh, what here, um, I think it's very well worth remembering. You know the good things, the good things, and the not so good things the ESB have done and are doing. I suppose the the fact that they have um, it's great to have the ESB there in terms of the social welfare schemes that we have in this country and you know the various like free electricity and heating schemes. But I think there's, there's an issue as well where the ESB have tried pilot schemes, particularly in broadband, and it hasn't really worked. I know I can give you an example of the town of Chum, County Galway, the area I represent. And they were they actually had to abandon the scheme and we had to start all over again and wait for a bleed or not, wait for a water and sewer scheme to come to Chum so that we could put the broadband you know, underground. So I think we have to just, just be careful about that. You know, there are there's good it's like the, the cure is egg they say good in the good in parts. And uh, I, I, because I think there's 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 um, been reference to, you know, leaving everything to the ESB. I, I don't think we can do that. Uh, I just applaud what they've done, but I just have to say, a caution, that we can't allow them to do everything. I don't think they'd ex they expect to do that. More investment, Chairman, and, and people working together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, last time, uh, We just have a summation word from you now uh, to end, and we'll uh, respond. Okay, so the, the the best thing the committee could do for us would be allow us to, to to try and get policy to change a bit, so that we could pilot this Scandinavian model here in rural in rural parts of, of the border counties. You know, a lot of people have asked that. Uh, we think that that's the best that, that the best thing that this committee could try to to achieve for us. Um, they are looking at it, but it's, it's by no means over the line, and they'll have to talk to Daddy, who are more conservative. Uh, um, so that, that would be the, the main thing. Um, in terms of, you know, Donegal County Council and Derry City Council established there like 20 years ago. Um, it, it wasn't really to, to do big things, you know, it was more to transfer good ideas uh, from other parts of Europe, uh, and that's exactly what we're doing with this, this Scandinavian model. Uh, we, we found out, you know, about 10 years ago when we got involved with the border corridor, um, because there was no broadband, uh, so we were forced to get involved in it. Uh, we gained a lot of experience, um, uh, and so did both councils as well. Um, like, that, that 25 million that you're talking about there, that, that would have been spent on those four fibre optic lines that run between Letterkenny and Derry, it would have been an, uh, it, it would have been spent on a wireless city model uh, in the centre of Derry. Uh, it would have been spent using interreg money to deploy uh, wireless uh, wireless capability um, in rural parts of Donegal and the border areas. And it was done actually by a local company in Derry that done it, and uh, it's it's a very good solution. Um, but the, the, the big point really is that the whole broadband game is, is moving on. It's, you know, we're moving now for where 30 to 40 megabits per second is the norm, up to 1,000 megabits. That, that's, that's the perspective. Uh, and I suppose you know, that, that's what we're aiming for. That's, that's, that's what we're trying to prepare the border areas, and particularly the Northwest, um, for that, that kind of scenario. Uh, and we think that, that um, if local communities in the border areas were allowed to pilot this approach, then uh, we think we could do a job there because we have the expertise. We, the, the councils, Donegal County Council, Derry City Council have a lot of expertise in this as well. 
Um, th th there is a view that maybe the expertise doesn't exist outside the, the departments, but it, but it does. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, could I just thank you? Are you okay? Did you want? Yeah. Chair, just to again thank the members of the committee for hearing us on this today because it is a, it is an essential issue I think going forward and it is I think what needs to happen is people need to be thinking about the provision of broadband in the same way that they do other basic utilities like water like electricity not like a luxury service that you that you procure but something which everyone needs. Thanks, the thank you. Yeah. If I might, just on behalf of the yeah. members, we could, we could record for. I mean, the correspondence for us, for our yeah. correspondence, absolutely. The of the group, yeah, yeah, that, that's no problem, Senator. Yeah. So to thank to thank the group, the presenters, very much for your presentations. Uh, you, it's been a very interesting presentation, and of course, it's extraordinarily relevant. And if we're to give it a real effect and create a real piece of evidence, this is one area we should be doing it in. So thank you for the very worthwhile presentations. Uh, it is a serious problem, we you know, in rural Ireland, and uh, it has to be worked on collaboratively and every way we can. Uh, we're, we will, as a committee, and through the Secretariat here, raise the matter with the Minister, directly with the Minister and his senior officials, uh, and uh, the, the Minister for Communications, uh, Energy and Natural Resources. That would be done as a matter of priority with both the Minister and the senior officials. And and rise in, the, yes. in, in our correspondence, oh, you're already coming to Of course, of course, no problems at all. No, mm -hmm. uh, no one it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, we will then uh, ultimately arrange to have the minister or senior officials come before the committee to discuss mm -hmm. implementation and to discuss an actual mm -hmm. product. Uh, we will also have the matter raised for the North South Ministerial Body. So what we're effectively saying to you is that you haven't wasted your sweetness on the desert air. You've made a good presentation and there will be product and there will be an outcome. You can meet so next week at the North Side Ministry. Absolutely. The next week. Thank you, Senator, yeah. for that yeah. assistance. I will. Yeah. Uh, so that will be done. And also, if I could thank you very much collectively and individually, and then if I could say to the committee, to my colleagues on the committee, that there is another group from the Family Carers Consortium going to address the committee in a few moments, so if committee members could wait for that. So thank you all very much. So we're suspending for a couple of minutes. The Carers Cross Border Consortium, rather, and the delegation includes Rosalind Doonan from the Carers Association, Sean Cotty, the Carers Trust in Northern Ireland, uh, Maria Mulligan, volunteer and social worker, Jennifer Van Asfegan, uh, Disability Federation Ireland, Siobhan McNiff, HSE. And you're welcome to the meeting. Uh, we're very aware of the invaluable work, I think it's something we're all passionate about, the invaluable work that carers engage in every day, in caring for family or friends who need help because of frailty, illness or disability. It, and every, I think it touches an emotion and a nerve in everyone. Today we will discuss the supports available for carers across the island and explore the opportunities for greater cooperation in developing policy in this important area of health provision. Uh, just as technicalities, before I invite you to make your presentation, I want to advise you, the witnesses, that you are protected by absolute privilege in respect of all references to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease making remarks on a particular matter, I don't think it would arise, and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter to only a qualified privilege in respect of your remarks. You're directed that only comments, evidence in relation to the subject matter of the meeting a, is admissible. And you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you are not to criticize or make charges against a member of either house, etc. I, I don't think these difficulties would occur. I will now ask Ms. Doonan to proceed with her opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair, and good morning, committee members. Um, thank you for your for your opening remarks. Uh, my name is Mrs. Rosalind Doonan, and I'm from uh, the Carers Association. 
Um, and we are here today to outline and discuss Northside cooperation in the area of family carers. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the work of Deputy Joe McHugh and Deputy Tony McLaughlin, uh, who have demonstrated a keen interest in supporting family carers uh, and appreciate all the work they have done so far. Um, this cross-border consortium came together because we recognise that co cooperation in this area makes sense because the increasing challenges facing family carers on both parts of the island uh, are similar. Uh, there is no doubt that working together, benefits will accrue from pooling expertise, resources and exchanging good practice. This will achieve a better life for family carers on the island of Ireland. Um, the, the members of the consortium who are not here today are uh, Cathy McGowan from the Western Trust um, and Noreen Kettles from the United, Shane Martin from the Psychologist and um, Frank Morrison from the HSE. Um, and we've also received guidance and training from Ruth Italian from of the Centre for Cross Border uh, Studies, and I'd like to acknowledge that. Um, a family carer is someone who is providing an ongoing significant level of care to a person who is in need of that care in the home due to illness or disability or frailty. A family carer is not identified by gender, colour, creed or nationality, rather as those facing similar caring situations and feelings irrespective of where they live. It can be said that there are four kinds of people in the world, those who have been carers, those who will be carers, those who are currently carers, and those who need to be cared for. And if you just think about that for a minute, and I know you will agree, it is not something we often consider or think about, but it is a fact that one way or another, caring will come into all of our lives at some stage, and we as a society need to grasp that reality and plan around it. People are living longer on this island in both jurisdictions and it is inevitable that if this, if this trend continues, the number of family carers will continue to grow, resulting in increased demands for relevant and timely support mechanisms to be put in place to provide support to those who have cho chosen to care for a loved one. And I suppose chosen is not a very good word there because few uh, people choose to be carers. It's usually trust upon them and uh, it's not a job that somebody applies for. There are currently 396,864 family carers that are registered on the island of Ireland and they're giving us 12,664 hours of unpaid care per week. In the Republic of Ireland, the census 2011 recorded 187,000 family carers, of which 4,228 were under the age of 15 years. That's kind of startling. Yet in Northern Ireland, the 2010 census returned a figure of 214,000. 214,000. Clearly, there's need to research this glaring difference. And that is something that we need to address as well. Not only do family carers make a profound difference to the health, well-being and quality of life of those that they care for, but they also make a huge and unacknowledged contribution to the economy. Family carers in the Republic of Ireland contribute 77 million per week providing 900,000 hours of care daily to the ill, frail and people with disabilities. This is equivalent to one third of the total annual cost of the HSE and is five times what family carers cost the Department of Social Protection and Income Support. Full-time family carers contribute on average 72,500 a year. Can you imagine what would happen if, like the air traffic controllers in France recently, I think we heard it all in the media, um, all decided to down tunes and go on strike and bring all the people they care for to our community health uh, centres and hospitals. The health service would collapse and thousands would die. But of course we all know that this will never happen. No matter what stresses or strains carers have to endure, they will never forsake their jobs. Carers are the backbone to the provision of care in the home community. And the point there is, we all talk about care in the community, but what is care in the community? There is no community. It is individual families and neighbours taking care of pe people. So when we talk about community, we have to be very uh, aware of what we're actually, where, what, where is this uh, elusive community? The significant demographic changes to the Irish population structure which are expected to occur over the next number of years will have major implications for publicly provided supports and services. Coupled with the reforms in both the structure and delivery model of our health system will have profound implications for family carers. 
It ex expected that Ireland's ageing population and medical advances in relation to disability and chronic illness will result in more people of all ages with longer term and complex care needs will be cared for according to government in the community. But of course we all know that this in reality means care for at home by family members. And the thing about that is, and I think the real thing with the difference between now and we say 20 years ago, is that people that would be cared for at home would not have very high level of needs, of medical intervention or needs. They would be probably frail and maybe um, uh, people with uh, a mild to moderate disability, but certainly not um, uh, uh, um, the, the complex needs that people are now being able to care for at home. And I'm not saying that they cannot be cared for at home in this, I'm saying that they need support tonight. There's a change and, and we need to respond to that change. We acknowledge that there are positive and more rewarding aspects to caring, but there are also huge challenges and demands. Research shows that the high percentage of carers experience physical and ill health and emotional and psychological problems as a result of long-term caring. And this is a fact, it's, it's a fact no matter where in the world you're caring. I, I would like to acknowledge the government's publication in 2012 of the National Carer Strategy, which recognised, supported, empowered, that, that's its, its tagline, which, and its vision uh, statement, which says, carers will be recognised and respected as key partners. They will be supported to maintain their own health and well-being and to care with confidence. They will be empowered to participate as fully as possible in economic and social life. And we welcome this strategy and its vision. And believe if there, if there was delivery of the four goals and 42 objectives contained with therein, this would go a long way to bringing family carers to centre stage in the delivery of care in the home. But unfortunately, nearly two years later, with less than two years to go of the strategy, very few of the options have been delivered. In fact, it's, 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 it's sad to think how little of it has been delivered. I note in February that you had a meeting uh, with the high-ranking civil service from the Department of Health outlining to this committee areas of cooperation that they are engaged with. As it is common when the Department of Health and the HSC when speaking about health, family carers were never mentioned. And yet it is the policy of both governments to progress care in the community. But they ignored the most important resource to deliver this, family carers. They are ignored mainly because no department has a remit for family carers. Uh, they are, uh, the Department of Health has a remit to provide services to people who are ill, but not for the people who are caring for them, outside the paid employees, of course, of the department and the HSC. The Department of Social Protection views family carers as recipients of benefits and not as contributors to the economy. When the opposite is the case, family carers are the only people who have to work for their benefits. Because family carers do not have a recognised status within health provision, they do not receive the supports or services they need. This is particularly evident when you look at how caught and EU interreg funding is dispersed within health. It is focused on the patients and the agencies taking care of them, but little thought goes into the needs of voluntary carers. And just on that point, in the last uh, couple of weeks, um, uh, the court new fund of 50 million, I think, has been uh, announced. And I know uh, the uh, senior managers in, the, in my area, in the local uh, uh, Johnny Gold Sligo, have been briefed on that funding, yet there was nobody from carers uh, brought to that uh, briefing. So they're outside it all the time. Um, in the South, they do not even have a right to an assessment of their needs even when caring for people with high levels of dependency. One of the most remarkable and unusual aspects of family care in, in Ireland is that it, this is such a small island, and yet there is a vast difference in how supports are provided on both sides of the border, depending on which side of the border you live. There's a completely different model for delivering support in Northern Ireland. The model is a service-based with low supports, whereas in the public is medium supports and little service provision. I, I don't know which of these, of any of these models are the best, but it is striking that they're so different. So now I'll hand you over to my colleague here at the left, Sean, Sean Cahy, who uh, has travelled all the way from Belfast this morning. Thank you. In, in Northern Ireland, according to the 2010 census, there are nearly 214,000 family carers and an estimated 30,000 young carers. Of them, there are 49,412 carers in Northern Ireland who are over the age of 60. 20,340 of them carry more than 50 hours per week. 
5,816 of those are over the age of 75. And amazing as it may sound, there are 319 cars in Northern Ireland over the age of 90 with carrying responsibilities. Our organisation carried out a recent snapshot survey in the bottom of the screen area of Derry, and the following statistics were compiled, and they're seen as typical in rural areas in Northern Ireland. 71% of cars are carrying more than 20 hours a week, and 20 hours a week research has shown is the acceptable level of carrying that will damage your health. 50% of cars have been carrying for more than five years. 50% of cars said they were scared, worried, or anxious. 45% of cars help with personal care for a loved one. And 40% of cars care more than 10 hours per day. Support funding for care services is mainly provided by the five health trusts and very dependent on trust areas. All areas of a cars coordinator. The recent austerity cuts have seen this financial com commitment dwindle. For example, the Southern Health Trust <coughs> area, uh, the budget for CARES was cut from 150,000 to 90,000. This flies in the face of the recent Condon report, whose thrust is to keep people longer at home. The CARES allowance in the UK is £61.35 per week. In the Republic of Ireland, it's €204 Euro per week. I'd like if I may to give you a couple of real examples that we have faced, uh, and again, this is indicative of, of, of carrying in Northern Ireland at the moment. My name is Louise and I'm 62. My husband had a stroke about 10 years ago and I gave up work to care for him. He managed at first, but we're struggling to cope financially now. We de desperately need a shower installed and couldn't get help from anywhere, so we had to pay for it ourselves on credit. I work part-time to try and make ends meet. I feel like we're in a never-ending downward spiral. We're now in serious debt. I haven't had a break for as long as I can remember. My name is Alice. I'm 74 and I recently had a stroke. I've lost the use of my left arm. I care for my husband who has various medical problems and he can't get about on his own. Since the stroke has become more difficult to manage the physical things like getting him moist and dressed. Lucky for us we haven't lost our sense of humour. And he will say to me, look, Alice, all this running about after me is keeping you fit, girl. I do all the cooking and shopping. We have a lady who comes in to help with cleaning at the moment. We both call her Mary Poppins, though she doesn't know this. But this service has been taken away. I can't really understand why. The house won't clean itself. Well, later than last Thursday, the 26th of June, Northern Ireland Health Minister Edwin Poots said that the transformation of our health and social care service system requires good partnership working with carers. He also emphasised the need for greater recognition of the vital role that carers play in ensuring people are cared for in their own homes and communities for as long as possible. He said that the physical and emotional impact that caring can have on the well-being of individuals should not be underestimated. With an ageing population, carers will become older and we must ensure that they are properly supported to carry out their role without it negatively affecting their own health and well-being. Parents of children with learning disabilities worry about what will happen when they are no longer able to care for them. So it is vital that as carers become older, they are given reassurance and a peace of mind with regard to the future of their dependents. The Minister continued, caring for the care and planning for the future are therefore vitally important. We must develop new models of services for older carers and their families so they have the knowledge, resources and tools to plan for the future. We must also ensure that they are given practical help, including respite and short break care if needed. Making a difference to the lives of all in our society remains a firm priority for me. Transforming your care means more health and social care services will be provided in the community. Therefore, carers will play an increasingly important role in providing valuable services that complement those delivered by paid care services. Okay, Sean. Thank you. Um, what way do you want to do, Rosalind? Are you happy enough to open it up to the members, or do you want somebody else to come in? Do you want somebody else from the panel to come in now? Yeah, maybe if that's okay, uh, Chair. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we can just 
deliver. Keep it going. Yeah, okay. We're in your hands. Okay. We're very Thanks flexible. Thank you very much. Thanks a minute. No appreciate problem. that. Yeah. I appreciate your, your, your patience with this. No uh, the recent economic collapse of both jurisdictions has led to drastic austerity measures by governments and health agencies, all of which have a major impact on family carers throughout the island of Ireland. The publication of reports in both Northern Ireland Transforming Your Care and the Republic of Ireland Future Health have many similar strands which will impact on the lives of carers and future carers in relation to support available to them. The interesting thing about those two documents is that they are extremely similar when you read them, but yet the way services are delivered on both sides of order is extremely different. Um, in November 2012, the Department of Health published Future Health, a strategic framework for reform of the health service 2012 to 2015. This document clearly outlines the government's reform of its health service. One of the seven tangible changes that patients and clients will experience include, and I'm quoting, more people cared for in their homes. The reforms in social care will help older people and people with disabilities to live in their homes for as long as possible, rather than, rather than go into residential care. Future Health further sets out four pillars of reform, which includes health and well-being. This commits the government to the development of a comprehensive health and well-being policy framework. It further clarifies that health is more than merely the absence of disease. It is physical, mental and social well-being. It further acknowledges that prevention policies and programs can be cost-effective, can reduce health care costs and can improve the health of the population. The role of the health service must be seen as keeping people healthy as opposed to just treating sick people. So um, if you take that, then that's where you know, looking after carers can be very uh, cost effective. Because if you don't look after the carers, they will become your new sick people and they will be under the, the responsibility of the Department of Health. It is presumed that this includes the health and well-being of family carers who have been proven to be at high risk of illness because of their care burdens. Future Ireland is very detailed in its methodology of approach as to how the four pillars will be implemented, in particular how it will achieve more people to be cared for at home through its new integrated model of care, reforming social and continuum care and reforming primary care. One of the five key principles identified to underpin the delivery of social and continuing care is a shift towards service provision in the community, which includes natural sports, family, friends, etc., as far as possible. The glaring omission in that whole document, Future Health, is uh, uh, on how it's going to engage with and support family carers who will be the cornerstone to the successful implementation of future care. And I think only once in the whole document are family carers mentioned, other than to say they're going to do it. So Sean will just outline for you the position in Northern Ireland. Sean, just, I'm just yes. sorry for interrupting. I'm just yeah. conscious there's about six pages here. Now, this will be good. We can put this on record on our website. The members all have it. Um, are you looking to read all this into the record or are you picking bits? I'm looking at the last page there for the recommendations for this committee, I suppose that's a... Okay, Joel, I'll just make the point that, that, that yeah. Rosalind said, transforming your care is pretty much the same as the document down here. And, and again, there is no indica indication of how it's going to be resourced and how it's going to be funded. So I will echo exactly what Rosalind said and we'll get involved in that. Okay. And maybe with the members get involved here with their observations and questions. The bits that you want to feed back to, you're, you're free, free to do that. Thank you very much. Is that okay, Sean? Sure, sorry for, sorry for interrupting. Um, sir, uh, Deputy Brendan Smith, uh, followed by Colin Murphy. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Like you, I welcome the deputation, the group, and I compliment you on your work and a very detailed and good presentation there. And it goes without saying that we should all appreciate the outstanding work that's done right throughout our island by carers, indeed in, in other countries as well. But our concern is our own people. And I think the point is very made, well made by Rosie and Sean in regard to the need to support carers in the very, very difficult work that they do and the work that's oftentimes unsung and uncosted as well. I think one of the, one of the arguments that should be advanced along with giving proper recognition and support to carers is the fact that the age profile of our country is getting higher. People are living longer. So by definition, people would be, would, there would be need to care for people for longer. So, that we, so I think that's a very important element to any proposals um, where you seek support. Just as a, it should be a simple all-Ireland policy. You know, there's no political difficulties from whatever tradition people come throughout all of our island. And I think, I think it's, it's very good proposal you have to have, a not, have it in an all Ireland context and have the policies and the supports that are needed 
from both in both jurisdictions apply equally throughout the island. And I think it's it's um, an issue that should be raised at North South Ministerial Council. We have, uh, over the past few years, there has been established North South the Parliamentary Association, comprised of members of the Assembly, and members of the Dáil and Shannon. And I think we've we've discussed over the some health issues. Drugs was one of the issues, alcohol abuse that we discussed, and other issues that are generic, that are very, very important to all of our island, where there, there can be no political difficulty. And um, I think Deputy McHugh and myself are both on that committee, maybe a on it as well. I think maybe we should try to get that on to the agenda of the North South Interparliamentary Association. And it's jointly chaired by our town corner, Deputy Barrett, and by the Speaker of the Assembly, Mr. Hay. So I'm sure that those of us who are on that committee could seek to get it advanced as an item for discussion. Um, and you know that would be putting the All-Ireland context in it predominantly. So I just compliment you again, Rosie Machana, and your colleagues on the detailed presentation and the ongoing work. And it's very, very important that people out there who are working often as sole traders, if you want to call it, people working on their own, that they have people to advocate on their behalf as well, because they don't have time to do it themselves. So thank you very much. Thanks. I have another committee to go to, so you'll excuse me, I have time to go but I'll read up um, on the report of this meeting, and uh, that will be available to all of us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Brent. Uh, Conor Murphy, followed by yeah, thanks, uh, Chair, uh, and thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I mean, clearly understood the carers are the kind of forgotten end of the uh, health provision because primarily it relies on the fact that people do it out of a sense of love and duty. So, therefore, uh, the, the, the likelihood of them, as you say, up and, up and sticks and, and going on strike is, is non existent, and, and in, in that way, I think they end up being exploited by the health systems both sides of the border. Uh, and I think your point is correct in relation to transforming our care, which I'd be more familiar with, uh, with most people say, in theory, very good plan, uh, but no provision has been put to actually uh, implement it. Uh, and it was about taking people from acute medical uh, treatment into the community, then at the same token, uh, there was cuts in budgets for caring. So it was actually uh, contradictory. The, the, the outworking of it as opposed to the theory of it, which was completely contradictory and contradicted uh, the plan itself. Uh, so it is, it's a, it's a tough area, uh, and I, I uh, don't doubt that uh, an All Ireland uh, approach to that, particularly in the border areas where there are particular aspects, which, uh, uh, you know, access to services, access to GP services, access to transport, rural transport, all of those issues exacerbate, which is already a very difficult decision, uh, situation for people who find themselves caring uh, for others. So uh, I'm very interested in, in the recommendations to the committee. Uh, I know that the, our chair has said at the start of the meeting that we are going to put a bit of a focus on health matters, and I'm sure then that this is one, because as you say, when other people are putting focus on health matters, you tend to be left outside the room. So I think we could give an undertaking that we will, we will make sure this is part of our uh, de deliberations on, on all Ireland health matters uh, and trying to see uh, can some pressure be brought to bear on both departments, north and south, uh, to follow through on what were decent propositions with some practical uh, support for it. Again, I apologise, I have another engagement to go to, but I just wanted to register my support uh, for the presentation that you made. Okay, um, well, Connor, if you're leaving there, we'll, we'll take you up on your proposal. Obviously, the people here present will be delighted to do that. But just to inform the committee, we're looking at a wide ranging consideration of health matters across the board, and we're, we're looking at doing not, not just doing a one off session, but maybe do an ongoing uh, session, be it in relation to cross border GP out of our services or cross border car cardiology services. So, what we will do on the proposal of Connor there, if we get the second or from second or white is to incorporate carers both north and south into that white range of the board. That's agreed. According to the census, both sides of the border, there's 91,000 registered carers along the border areas, which is a substantial, substantial number. Okay, yeah. So, will our committee obviously be in touch with you at a, at a later date? So, thanks for that, Connor. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> just, just a personal matter. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> sorry. But just, just, you know, I know you're going to be putting this before a different agenda. I think this is an amazing project mm -hmm. for people to actually be able to um, draw government's attention to a policy that's actually not about itself and it's not about um, making money, it's not about saving money, it's actually about the core values of our society. Mm. It's actually about acknowledging that we're about something more as a group. Um, and it, there are not that many places within government policy that allow you to actually put that forward on the agenda right up there. This is who we are as a people. People who are actually doing background work matter. And I, I, you know, I really am quite passionate about that aspect of it. So, push it forward, please. Unfortunately, you come up against the big counters in the departments, and who, and, and I think that's. And this is where you can actually. Part of the there, 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 so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, that, that, that's fair enough, and look, I appreciate your intervention there, and your um, not just enthusiasm but dedication to the cause. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what we can do as well after this meeting, we can put it on. Yeah. Get, to whoever, to whoever the Minister for Health is going to be after next Tuesday, but we'll, we'll certainly put it on yeah. his or her uh, desk after that. And obviously for the information of Edwin Prince Northern Ireland as well, we can, we can give a copy as well. So yeah, no, you can take it, you have the support of this committee on that. So. Okay. Um, it, well, yeah, I can maybe the wrap up, yeah. We, like, ju just, well, just what we're on it. North South Ministerial Council will be up there next Thursday. Um, so that'll be an opportunity for us to raise this issue as well. I think that's extremely important. I think, you know, for, in order for to make progress in relation to implementing the two um, strategies, the two health strategies, both sides of the border, it's not possible without the, the support of family carers. They're not at the table at the moment. Mm -hmm. Even, as I say, you know, I mean to get... For me to get an appointment, even with the, the with court, it's impossible. And I've tried it. And you know, the, uh, uh, one of the people out of the office came to meet with me, but never came back. That's a year, year, and fourteen months ago. And seemed quite enthusiastic when I was speaking about it. But that was I've had no contact since. You know. Yeah. What, 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 what we can do, we, we've had caught on before this committee. What we can do is we can write directly to court as well. Yeah. 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 It'd be fantastic. Okay. Be absolutely um, brilliant. Yeah. So we're all focused on follow-up here today because Senator White was very uh, insistent this morning like that our committee shouldn't just be about just yeah. hearing presentations but use it as a vehicle for following up. So, thank you. Can I make one quick point, point uh, in relation to the assumption that, that this is a health issue for carers? Yeah. It's not as much broader. An example is that young people, young carers, yeah. who, who we support up to the age of 18 yeah. and, and try desperately hard to, to get their leave and certificate or to get their a levels can't take up university positions yeah. because of their current role. Okay. That's the society issue, so it falls in the housing, it falls in the education, yeah. and the assumption that it's just a health issue, is, it, it's not like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but we'll, we'll make that point at the SMC that it is a broader issue. Yeah. Okay. No problem. And the big difference in the, in the, in the, the allowance as counties, the bigger I am here is 75 yeah. euro, then 240 euro. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there's, there's 30,000 people in Northern Ireland earn more than 50 hours a week. Yeah. I'm making a commercial argument that that's a pound an hour yeah. that they're working for. If there was a factory anywhere in Ireland where the, where the, where the employees were getting a pound an hour, there would be an uproar. Yeah. Well, my, uh, also saying, well, I think you have to look at the, I suppose, at the totality of it in terms of, you know, the way it's, it, the whole services for family carers on both sides of the border are delivered. The, the services in Northern Ireland are probably better than what they are, they are much better than what they are here, even though the, 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 the support mechanism is, is less. But as I said in, the, in my thing, I don't know which model is the better model, or, e or either, or is it a combination of both? You know, like for instance, in Northern Ireland, you have carers coordinators. Siobhan McNippio uh, was a carers co coordinator with the HSC and took up another position in the HSC. It, her position was not uh, was not filled. Uh, now I know, you know, we're in economic times and all the rest of it, but at the same time, it was one. Of, it was considered a position not important enough to fill. And uh, and we had co carers coordinators throughout the country. We know have, we've none at the moment. Actually, we've no co carers coordinator in place at the moment. So I mean that tells you. And you know, again, Jennifer would have a, a, you know a, 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 an insight into it from the point of view of it, this is not about spending money. This is about how you spend money and how you spend it in a way that gets you best value. 
And, you know, the economic, if you look at it from an economic perspective, uh, the, the economics are is that you would look to, to begin supporting family carers because the more you support them, the more people you can remove from residential care, from acute hospitals earlier. Yeah. It's it's a no-brainer when it comes from point of view. Of, of what, and yet, the problem is, and I know, we know this, Sean and I and everybody at this table, this side of the table, knows the reason why. It's not because you as government don't want to help carers. You do. I know you do. I know from talking to you uh, that you do, and, and you all are aware of it because you all have an experience of it at some stage in your life. It's because of where carers sit within government. They're not in health. They're not in social protection. They've, that, that, that is where the real, real problem is. So they're not the remit of the, of the Minister of Health. They're not the remit of the Minister for Social Protection or, or Transport or whatever. They, they, and that's the students they fall between. So one of the things that Sean and I have spoken about is that if you had uh, a, a, a junior minister for carers or somebody or, or a senior person with a dedication to carers, family carers, we wouldn't be talking. We wouldn't be talking about what we're talking about today, because it's somebody in the department of health who's responsible. Well, it, 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 somebody it, it, must tell somebody. You're right, I, Senator. I, I do think that it makes sense that it's department of health. But then again, on the other, look at it from this perspective: if you, have, if it's department of health, but their their supports are coming from the protection, and their supports are viewed as a drain on the uh, on the economy. We all support. You know, all supports are. Then how does that sit? Now, and I'm not asking for, and I'm not even going there in relation to paying family carers. That is not the route to go. I am saying that you know you, it, they need to be recognised for for what they are doing, and they need to have a national recognition, like what Maria is talking about. That we need as a society to to step up to this mark. And it, in all fairness, it was never an issue in 20 years ago, 10 years ago, because granny that was cared for at home or the person with the mild disability that was cared for at home, you didn't need the services you need now. People now, one time people went into hospital on, on stretchers, on, on, the, on, on very special beds and stretchers and, and, and ambulances. Now they're coming home from hospital. Uh, in ambulances, on stretchers, with paraphernalia, you know, that have to be, you know, from the from feeding, from and Siobhan is, is very, very acutely aware of that in, in as acting uh, director of nursing in um, our latest hospital in um, and very involved in it. So things have, the, the world has shifted, the whole thing has shifted. So we need to catch up with it. And that's where I think the real, real problem is. Would you agree? Well Rosa I'm glad we've gone off script. You've got the passion of Rosa, Rosalind Dunn in there for, for us at large there, so thanks for that, Rosalind. Yeah. Well, I know Jennifer wants to go in here, but, but Deputy Pringle has been indicating here for a while. Is that okay, Jennifer, just for the, the Thomas in for, for, for a second and then... Uh, thanks, Chairman. I'd like to thank the few for the presentations. It's, it's very interesting. Um, just looking at what you're looking for from the committee in terms of your presentation and stuff like that, what could we do, I think. Rosalind answered one of my questions in relation to COD and what context you've had with them and, uh, over the last over the last while, and I think that's something that we should take up as a committee and um, develop there to, to try and get the cares included within within COD to at least to get some momentum in looking at how cross border issues can be dealt with and stuff like that as well. Um, and, and in relation to the North South Interparliamentary Association, I'm a, a member of that as, as the chairman is too as well, so we will take it up there as, as well as now it'll be a way of raising the profile maybe or getting it out before people or that uh, in that sense. Um, now I'm, I'm just wondering just in relation to I mean the reason maybe the carers fall between the stools all over the place is because that's the way it's nice to keep it that way because you don't have to recognise actually the value and the and the need to actually do something if you're between those stools all the time. Uh, this might be kind of a they, they seem a bit sensitive about it, but I've just noticed that, I mean today the national accounts have been have been published and they've included prostitution and drug dealing in terms of a value to our economy. And I'm just wondering, has the Carers Association or would there be any value or use in maybe looking at how carers contribute to the national accounts and stuff like that there as a way of raising the profile of, mm -hmm. of carers and the work that they do? And would that be something that we could um, take up as well? 
The other, just the specific question I have, just one of your points you're looking for from the committee is to facilitate access and to interact funding for family carers. Just wondering what you actually mean by that. Is that in terms of research or is it in terms of actual supports and stuff like that there? Is just what actually you're, you're looking at there? Well, Thomas, uh, thank you, sir. I, um, I think, um, you know, research is extremely important as well because until we have very good bodies of research, um, we don't have benchmarks and where, to, and where to work from. That's very important, but also in relation to, again, it's about, you know, getting... Where I see it, there's a circle, and inside that circle is everything to do with health. And outside that circle are the carers. Yet the carers are, are absolutely central to that, to get to the success of everything in health going forward. Because we, again, I say we, we're moving, you know. So anything that gets us in there as, you know, equal partners and recognition that we're the people that's going to have to deliver on all of these new policies that government have uh, are going down the road on. And that is just, you know, if you could see it like that in terms of like cost, interest, that's what, you can't do anything without funding. We don't have in the national government, and I recognise that, that we're all trying our best to do it the best we can with what we have. But there are these uh, external, you know, to some extent, funding bodies that are, are providing a lot of funding for various different things in health as well but the carers are not part of that and I, I, and that's where I'm, I'm thinking about I don't I am not qualified enough in how these uh, massive uh, European funding mechanism work but I do know uh, enough to know that interreg and court are the mechanisms by which they are dispersed down to the down, down, down to the, to, to the um, community you know, so I mean, I just, I mean, I suppose I have a, a hang up on the word community because I just think that, you know, save what it is, it's family carers, we're sending people home. And, you know, at home, you're expected to look after them. And if they need a catheter changed or if they need, and I'm not a, a medical person, so uh, I make a very bad nurse as well, but I, I'm probably a, a worse carer. But um, I do see that, the, the, you know, the extent of the work that somebody has to do at home, you know. I, I, you know, we had a, a somebody to, to, to this week, I had a carer, a mother, mother of three boys, her little child had a um, stem cell brain tumour when the woman was born. He screams all the time. And, she, you know, she'd only, it's, she was expected to 24-7 to look after it, after out of school hours without any extra help. You know, all things. Just, just on that community, one of your proposals on here is to what to have a whole a centre of care. Absolutely, Joe. I mean, when you have, again, you wouldn't have talked about this, you would have thought I was loop off the wall if I talked about this uh, 10 or 15 years ago. There would have been no need for that because nobody would have been at home that would have needed medical 24-7 care. Now they are there. So if you have, and houses I've been in, where you only have around it is hoists and, and wheelchairs and all kinds of medical paraphernalia. And, you know, the, and people throw, it trips in and out all day. Can you imagine having other people coming into your house, making cups of tea and so on and so forth, just because you have somebody that needs to be cared. And it needs to be made a centre of care if we're serious. Or else, the other option is, we look at the two health strategies. I don't think that's going to happen on both sides of the border. And let's, before we write up these kind of health strategies and the way forward, mm -hmm. is that we see how, what the, how do we mean by this? Or what's that going to mean for the people on the ground? So it's either we look at the health strategies. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not asking necessarily for it to happen because I don't think really. I think there is a willingness, a, an absolute willingness among Irish people to look after their loved ones at home. And I also think their loved ones want to be at home. And furthermore, I think it's the place for them. So we're not, we're not, you're not you're pushing, you know, the, the doors are open. It's just a matter of having the supports to be able to do that without killing yourself. It, 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 and if you look at the stats around ill health among carers, it's, 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 it's frightening. It's really frightening. You're caring for somebody, you know, full on, with very little supports over a period of five, six, seven, 10, 15, 20 years. 
I tell you, your, your health has been massively compromised. And, you know, the simple things, you know, that we have done, you know, the, that has made such a difference. We had a programme, thankfully, supported and by the HSC in the West, and I can't but acknowledge that. We're, uh, going, people going to the Exeter House down in Kelman Crennan and Donegal for, you know, breaks. Yeah. The difference that that made. Yes. Three days away, respite. I, I, I just couldn't describe it to you. The car, I have cards that stand. We've sent over 100 people. And the difference that that made, but the difference to the economy it made, if you want to be really black and white about this and say, you know, um, what, difference, what difference does that make to the economy? This is the difference. We sent people there who were really at the very burnout stage. And the difference that it made was that they were no longer burned out. So what did they do? They're not looking for the residential place anymore. They're prepared to continue with the care at home, saving the state huge amounts of money. So the, rash, the economic, financial rationale for looking after carers is just as I said, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. It is the way to go. And, and you, like, I suppose, because I'm so involved in it, I suppose, you know, uh, on the front line of it, all day, every day. Like, one Friday morning, I'm in the office, I get a phone call, guy on the phone, I know he's distressed, don't know what was wrong, and he usually asks people for their name first, wouldn't give me his name, all he wanted to know, the reason he was ringing me, was to tell me that he could no longer care for his mother. He was providing full-on personal care and everything for his mother, and he had he had decided, he was giving it up. Now, I didn't for, for a minute. I didn't really know what he was telling me. The reason he was telling me was that I, we would be able to uh, uh, um, support his mother when he was gone. What he was really telling me was. And I was an hour on the phone to him, and I will never forget this. But he was really telling me he had decided to end his life. He was, he was going to commit suicide, and he had a plan he was going to go away. Now, I'm on the other end of the phone. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he's from. So I have to try and elicit that from him. Make a long story short, I figure out where he could be. Got out to public health nurses, and I brought the people on the phones to public health. Could this be your client? Is it possible to just give you your plan? Discovered, yeah, one person recognised who it could be. Got to them, and I'm still on the phone to them, and we got them into the Exeter House. They were one month in the Exeter House. They came out of there and they were absolutely perfect. We got supports in for them. They're still caring for their mother. That is reality. That's what it's like out there. And that should never have happened. It needn't have happened. And if that man, he was only 53 years of age, his mother was 84, 85, if that man had been got the supports, maybe he didn't ask for them. You know, sometimes people don't ask for them. You need to know who these people are. Do you know? If that man had got the supports in time, I wouldn't have had that phone call. And that's these are the things you don't forget. And this is the thing, these are the things that's very easy to be isolated from when you're not in the business. I mean, before I came, came into the Carers Association, so what did I know about it? I was lucky enough. I didn't, didn't have these things didn't come into my sphere of, of, of life. But now I'm very acutely aware, and I know that someday they're going to affect me. I definitely know that. I, I'm either going to be cared for, or somebody's going to, be, or I'm going to be caring for somebody. Well, in the meantime, this committee will look after your aims and objectives. So we can guarantee you that. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, Rosie. But I'm, I, I'm conscious that. Jennifer has been trying to get on there. Uh, That's okay. I actually think, um, thank you, Rosie, and I think you covered probably the um, the area that I was planning to on, which is around, first of all, the, the economic uh, rationale. And I think if you look at the report on page nine, we have tipped on the iceberg there in terms of the economic rationale through um, just exactly what you said is, is investing in the carers now in order to prevent them becoming a burden on our health system through burnout and through, through the increase in care burden and that makes absolute economic sense. Um, you know, so the, the, the very, and uh, Deputy Murphy referred to it in terms of counting beans, um, this makes financial sense, this makes total economic sense in terms of the investment in order to prevent that landslide at the other end and the burden on our health services. So, Rosie, you've covered it very well in terms of, you know, very um, real examples of how that happens on the ground, much better than we can do in sort of anecdotal or in any sort of um, scientific way that, that having those real life experiences and uh, brought to the table really gives life to and to, to the words on, on, on page nine. Um, you mentioned as well research and you'll see in our, in our proposal on page um, eight and nine 
what exactly the model that um, that this consortium is putting forward in terms of cross-border collaboration and research plays a very key role in that and we're very mindful that there, there's lots of research out there but there's a, there's a gap in research in terms of um, what's not there and I think Siobhan is probably an area that you have some expertise on um, but a critical or a very core element of the project proposal or the, the model proposal that we're putting forward is around research to inform best practice, to inform policy and to find out, you know, we, we talked about the uh, disparities between the North South model. We don't have the answer as to which is the, the most um, appropriate or the best model, but certainly through research, we would look to identify what the carer needs are. Is it financial support that works best, or is it the practical hands-on support um, that, that may be more prevalent in, in Northern Ireland that works best? So research is, we're very mindful that, that is, a, 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 is a really important element of any cross-border collaboration, and it's something that we would be prioritising as part of our project proposal. Jennifer, thank you. Um, now, um, you, you may be ahead of yourself there, Jennifer, following that um, contribution, um, or, you, or you may have your homework done. Um, the new round of Interreg 5 uh, hasn't been finalised yet, um, but there's four themes emerging, uh, and the four themes that are emerging, which, in, in, as I say, Take this with a pinch, pinch of salt. Um, it's not finalised yet, and it will be finalised in September of this year. The four themes that are emerging are number one is health, uh, number two is research and innovation, including research uh, and health and lifestyle. So that is the second theme that's emerging. The third theme, just for the record, is sustainable transport, and the fourth theme that is emerging is the environment. So. You know, the language you're talking about there, I suppose, assuming that this will be the, the final um, makeup of the, the, the four areas, you might be on the right track there. So that's, I hope that's helpful. Uh, and obviously, you'll be watching that space closely in the next couple of months. Um, any other observations or questions? Are we good? We're coming near the time. Um, yeah, oh, okay, Debbie, bring like, Just maybe. Chairman, just yeah, yeah, well, uh, I'm not a member of the committee, as you know, but I'd just like to uh, compliment you and, and indeed the committee for, for uh, um, bringing, bringing uh, the carers both north and south here today. I know that I spoke to you on a number of occasions about it, uh, both those and I uh, from our uh, area in Saigon and the northwest. And I think it's vitally important, it's very, very educational here this morning to, to listen to the comments and to, to the presentations that are made. And I know that you're in uh, certainly in good hands here uh, under the stewardship of, of Joe McHugh and this committee. And I think this is the right forum to be in this morning here and going forward in relation to interreg funding and that. Because, uh, Rosalind, as you, as you appreciate, Chairman, the enthusiasm that this lady uh, generates, and I think that uh, I've been on the receiving end of it for, for the last number of years. And uh, uh, that's in, 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 the, in the Northwest. And I think that. In relation to uh, funding and you know the the, the, the crumbs that, that are you know uh, being allocated and uh, the work that's been done and i see it at first time myself the, the cares and the, the work and the commitment and the dedication to their um, loved ones uh, over the years and i think that um, perhaps maybe at times i've seen whereby people are taken for granted the cares are taken for granted that so i think it's vitally important chairman and i, I compliment you and lead your committee for 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 this meeting here this morning to, to bring both uh, groups together and I think it's, it's very worthwhile and it's very it's certainly it's educational for me and I'm sure for others and I think that uh, going forward that uh, this is a step in the right direction Chair. so I, I thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks Debbie. I'm conscious of the doll vote and uh, Debbie Wright is going to do something he's never done before, he's going to make a contribution in 30 seconds. <laughs> no, no, just uh, I, I want to join in the welcome to you uh, because I think what you do is really important and I sincerely apologise for being very an unavoidable, just absolutely unavoidable situation, which you you don't want to be bored by. But I just would join in Deputy McLaughlin and the chair, and I'm glad it's going to be a proactive response to your submission. And I also look forward to reading. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Deputy. Okay, for, for, we're going to have to wrap up because we'll have a vote now. We have a lot of follow-up here, but we've made a, a number of commitments. And just to recap, 
Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that it's not just health, but we are going to give the presentation to the Minister for Health south of the border. And for the information of the Northern Minister, uh, Edwin Prince, we're going to give that presentation as well. But uh, the, me the mechanism which might be important is the NSMC. So we're going to use the opportunity, and I know Senator White will be going to our man next Thursday. And you can take it as read that Senator White will ensure that this item is on the agenda for the Joint Secretariat. Um, the wide-ranging issues in health as part of this committee, we're planning that at the moment. So you can take it as read that your North-South Cares uh, issues will be, will, will be incorporated into that. And, uh, and finally, just to recap again on the Interreg 5. If they are the four emerging thematic areas, I think it would be important to keep, uh, to keep, keep, to keep uh, a close eye on that. And lastly, we also said we'd follow up on writing directly to COT. Okay? Uh, we'll, we'll certainly do that as well. But just to thank you, thank you all. Uh, and thank the people outside of Rosen that have the patience to, uh, that maybe wanted to make a contribution, but I think you can see the, the passion uh, of Rosen doing and, and, and the commitment to the cause is just uh, visible. And, uh, to be seen by us all, and we really, really appreciate you being here today, Rosalie, and your colleagues, uh, both north and south. So, thank you as well. Thank you, Chairman. Just to say, congratulations the rest, the cut and the rest paid care grant. That was really heavy stuff. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I, I know. And, and that was really yeah. Okay. Well, we'll end that. But it is a big, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. 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 But it's a bigger, it's a bigger, it's a bigger thing. Okay. It's, it's about looking at the whole thing, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, th thank, thank, thank you all, and uh, thank you guys. It is adjourned until Thursday, 25th of September at 10:15 p.m.